welcome to the Cambridge Science Festival. <laughs> so I need to say a few words because those of you who know this event, some of you may have been here before, know that once we start, this literally goes like clockwork. So uh, bear with me for a couple of minutes. The first thing I need to do is to ask anyone who has a cell phone or any other portable device of that kind to please turn it off so that we don't hear it. We're recording tonight and we hope to use the video that we create in all kinds of ways online to extend the, uh, the discussion that starts here uh, in other ways. So we don't really need all those beeps uh, and uh, calling ringtones. The second thing I want to do is to give a sincere vote of thanks to First Parish, who have kindly let us use this beautiful meeting room uh, for this event. Please show your appreciation for First Parish. <laughs> for those of you who are visiting New England for the first time, this is a wonderful New England uh, venue, and all interiors in New England are like this. <laughs> now, I want to uh, describe how this event works. It is uh, called Big Ideas for Busy People, and the emphasis is on punctuality, so, uh, as well as science. So we, <laughs> so we have a screen here, and you're looking at a five-minute symbol. And uh, I'm going to ask our uh, kind volunteer there to turn the countdown clock on now so that you can see how it goes. Um, you can probably predict where it's going from here, but it will do various things uh, as, as I speak. And this is going to happen every time a speaker gets up. And the rules of engagement are very simple. Every time we turn to another one of our uh, illustrious speakers, uh, the countdown clock will be reset to five minutes. And while they speak to us about their big idea, the clock will continue to do this, uh, and when the time is up, uh, being extremely punctual as well as distinguished people, they will stop. And we will then reset the clock to five minutes, and there's five minutes for questions. And the questions should be uh, also concise. It doesn't help if people ask extremely long, rambling questions, but then Big Ideas audiences never do, so that's okay. Uh, but there are two mics, one over there and one over there, and if you want to ask a question, Please just go and stand by a mic. If there's more than one of you, do that uh, wonderful uh, thing of queuing. And um, we'll try to get as many questions as we can in, in five minutes. And then when the countdown clock stops, we will stop. And uh, we'll go on to the next talk. Right, so that's enough for me. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to go back to our uh, introductory uh, speaker, Mohammed Zaman, designing for the bottom billion. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm driven and motivated by simple solutions. Simple solutions for the poorest of the poor people on this planet. The people who are at the very bottom of our economic ladder. Among many problems that they face is the problem of disease. And among those problems, one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest and perhaps most stubborn problems is that of HIV and malaria. Last year, just last year alone, we had about 225 cases of malaria. That's about three-fourths of the population of this country. We had the same number, perhaps a little bit bigger, in 2010, a little bit bigger in 29, 2009, and so on and so forth. But this is not the only problem. It's only part of the problem. What makes the problem even more difficult to manage is about 40% of all anti-malarials, 40%, and in certain countries, including Nigeria, about 60 to 70% of all anti-malarials are either substandard, counterfeit, or inactive. Now imagine if you have 225 million patients and about 40% at least are all counterfeit, what do you do? That means there's a financial burden, of course there's a loss of life, but above all, there is resistance to good medicines. How do you address that? And this is not just sort of a random problem. In my own country, of Pakistan, just earlier this year, in a matter of a week, 180 people died. In Niger, in 1995, 2,500 babies and kids died in a matter of weeks because of substandard medicines. Go to West Africa and you see something like this. You can choose your own drug based on the color that you like, shape, size, 
packaging, anything you want. You don't know what's in there. Snake oil, street chalk, maybe just powder. How do you address that problem? And not all drugs come in sort of this brightly colored package. Sometimes you can't tell which one is which. One of them is counterfeit, one of them is real. I don't know which one. But the problem is they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, forms and fashions, and affect every single major country. Even in this country, there was a hematin-based crisis. A couple of months ago, there was an issue about cancer drugs. How do you do? How do you handle this kind of problem? What exactly do you do? So what you need is a simple solution that is affordable, portable, cheap, and is easy to use. Whether it is a dock in Nairobi where you get all the drugs and they need to be inspected, or it is a small, tiny village in rural Pakistan. So what we have done is we have come up with something that is like this. So basically, you take the drug, you dissolve it, and we have come up with a set of molecules that we would be able to sort of bind to these drugs. And we can shine a light on it using an LED and detect it with something that we've all turned off, a cell phone. And, and from there, we can get the intensity, the size of the molecule, the shape of uh, the, the concentration of the molecule, the amount of the molecule, the intensity, everything that we need. Okay? And this thing looks about this big. All right? Size of a Band-Aid. A little bit bigger than a penny. And the idea is simple. If you want to be able to test these drugs on the field, up and down the supply chain, all the way from the major city to the small village, whether it is malaria, TB, HIV, you name it. And my hope is for a disease-free world. But until that happens, I want to make sure that the drugs that we get are the real deal. Thank you. So it turns out that five minutes is far too long for our speakers. They don't actually need it. That's right. Oh, there were questions now. Sorry. Right. So we're going to have questions, and the clock is going to be reset, uh, and our speaker certainly gets the full set of questions. Can you just, I'm going to ask an initial one, and by the way, you have to think quickly if you're going to do big ideas, so get to the microphones. Uh, not much time. Uh, you can start the clock now, sir. <laughs> there we go. Where does this device fit exactly? It fits on the package. Um, is that right? So it's about the size of a boom box. Remember those sort of things in the 80s and 90s? It's about this big, sort of a cassette player. I'm too young man. to remember those. I yeah. know that. Um, so uh, so the size of a Walkman, and this thing goes in there, you sort of dissolve your pill, and then there's a simple detection system that you can so use. So you dissolve the pill to make sure that it's, so it's uncheatable? Uh, well, it, you, can, you can use a syrup. You can sort of dissolve it in water. You can dissolve it in an acidic solution, depending on the nature of the drug. The idea is that there is some sort of training that would go with that, but it's minimal. OK, thank you. Now we have a first question over here. Is this on? Yeah, hi. So this is, the problem is counterfeit drugs, right? Yes, that's part of the problem. It's also substandard or expired or inactive drugs. How are you going to prevent there being counterfeit detectors? <laughs> that's an excellent point. <laughs> that, that's actually a very good question. So these things are typically manufactured using a microfabrication facility. And with the exception of the developed world, there are very few of those. It's pretty hard to sort of put these in place, but you're right. I mean, they could be counterfeits of the counterfeit detector. But we are, I think we are OK for a few years now. Thank you. <laughs> OK, we're buying time in the arms race. Yes, please. If you allow me a politically incorrect question, why would we want to help cure a disease in a third world to create more competition for our children and grandchildren? So, so that's, an, that's an actually, um, I, I'll, I'll answer it anyway. Um, so. <laughs> The, the point is that many of the diseases that we see in the developing world are actually influencing us as well. The HIV strains that we see now, the TB strains that we see now, are resistant strains to our own drugs. So if we don't really sort of cure the drugs over there, there's immigration, there's sort of other poverty-related aspects that influence the economics, the immigration, as well as the disease-resistant bugs that affect all of us. So we have to be very sort of careful in, uh, in managing diseases at all parts of the planet. Uh, I, I, I think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in detail. Okay, at some point. thank you. We have another questioner over here. How much did the detectors cost? Excellent question. This thing costs pennies on the dollar, about 10 cents. All right? The whole thing would cost probably a few hundred dollars, but you can do thousands of tests from, from this. But this thing is about 10 cents, or even less. Reliability of these things? Do I see someone else approaching the mic? 
Talk to reliability while they get okay, there. Okay, so, so the reliability is actually a good question. We have done uh, a bunch of control studies, and they're pretty robust. And you can do them over and over again to really see how you see, um, how you get, what kind of results do you get. But they're pretty robust in the field. Please. Um, can you make an all in purpose? all in one one, or do you have to design a different one for every drug? So the basic design for the, uh, the drug testing is about the same. You will have different probes for different drugs or different families of drugs. But one of the things we want to do is to be able to come up with something that is called multiplexing, where you can do a whole bunch of them on a single chip. We haven't gotten there, but at least for a single drug, we can do that, especially for antimalarials. Thank you. Yes. So I have a question. Um, this test sounds like what we call in the pharmaceutical industry a destructive test. Am, am I assuming that the, the pill that you test um, it can't be ingested and it won't work? So I'm a little concerned. Just if, if you have a bottle of pills and half of them are counterfeit or substandard and the other half, like you're going to test one pill. You can't tell about the rest of them in that, in that lot. That, that's an excellent question. There are two or three things that one can do. One is uh, a method based in a company call, uh, called Sproxil in Cambridge that tests also the packaging. So that's one uh, sort of level of testing. The other thing you have to do is you have to go do, use good statistics to make sure you're not going to test every single drug. We don't do that even in this country. You sort of test them statistically so that you can get a good sense of uh, the overall question. But it is possible that in a single package you may have some good ones and some bad ones. Yes, that is possible. Please. That's a one-minute sign. How are you going to distribute them? Like, who, who's going to sell them, and how are you getting them there when people need them? That, that's a very, very good question. And the typical venture capital market is not going to work because the profit margin is very small. So you have to come up with different business models. Right now, our, our basic uh, consumer is USAID, the WHO, and places like that. They are going to distribute them in major cities which have the responsibility of drug regulation. So for example, in Kenya, this would be Nairobi. In, in Zambia, where I work a lot, this would be based in Lusaka. And, and the idea is that since these are very portable, you can take them up and down the supply chain to uh, look at things in the villages and individual hospitals, clinics, and so on and so forth. And where is this in the uh, research innovation cycle? How close are you to implementation? So we are very close to implementing this for at least, at least um, anti-malarial tests. Uh, for anti-TB, we have developed some probes that we are developing, but for at least a class of malarial drugs, we are very, very close. Thank you. Wow.